hello neat aspirant how are you all hope you are doing good yes so today we are going to start with the lecture that is on digestion and absorption this lecture is important as around 12 to 16 marks can be easily scored from this chapter almost 3 to 4 questions are usually coming from this chapter so let us start without delay our topic that is on digestion and absorption so what is food anything which you eat is food or the food is the component which gives you some growth or gives you some components which help you to grow and repair your tissues yes you understood right food will provide you energy and some organic materials for growth and repair of tissues even some metabolic reaction are going to happen because of the components which are released from food involved in some metabolic reactions it is the basic requirement of all living organisms it acts as fuel acts as a fuel which supports all other system that supports all other systems for example your brain will not function if food is not there if you don't take food will your brain will work no so that is why you see it acts as a fuel that supports all other systems of body okay so let us continue further and see the components of food what is the difference between the food and nutrient now nutrients you see there can be two types one is the macronutrients so macronutrients are the ones that is carbohydrates proteins and fats these are called as macronutrients macronutrients are required in more quantities as compared to micronutrients here you see micro nutrients micronutrients will be required in less quantity these micronutrients are also known as protective principles of food these are also called as protective principles of food and macronutrients are also known as proximate principles of food so what do you mean by this and why you should study this see these terms are given in previous ncert so that is why it is important to know these terms also so this macronutrients are carbohydrates proteins and fat they provide you energy they are mainly important for providing energy here so macronutrients for providing energy whereas micronutrients they are, as they are called as protective principles they are helpful helpful to provide in providing immunity that means it is going to help you protect yourself from diseases like vitamins and minerals so vitamins and minerals they will be considered as micronutrients got it yes now so those bi bio macro molecules which you are eating for example carbohydrates fats and proteins which you took are they going to be utilized in that form no they have to be broken down by mechanical and biochemical reactions so food has to be broken down the complex food has to be bro broken down into simple absorbable forms so complex food has to be broken down into simple absorbable form so what is that simple absorbable form let's see for example you took proteins this complex food suppose you took protein now these proteins have to be broken down into amino acids otherwise they won't be absorbed into the blood so the simple absorbable form is amino acids now these amino acids are going to be absorbed into your blood so here what would have taken place is hydrolysis with the help of enzymes these reactions would have taken place and broken them into smaller constituents these are the simple absorbable forms is it okay with you so let us continue further so this can be done by mechanical digestion so mechanical digestion is kind of mastication going inside your mouth 
or the buccal cavity and even the mechanical digestion also takes place in the stomach so mechanical and biochemical reactions will take place and break the food into the simpler absorbable forms so let's see now digestive system is divided into two major comp headings that is alimentary canal that is a tube here you can see and the associated glands associated digestive glands for example if i talk about the associated digestive glands they are the salivary glands salivary glands liver and pancreas so these are the major glands in your body which will be helpful in providing some digestive enzymes or maybe some hormones which are required to digest the food okay and alimentary canal it is starts with buccal cavity and ends at the mouth at the anus region it starts with mouth and ends at the anus region so buccal cavity till anus region that is your alimentary canal that's a tube like structure you can see here this is a tube like structure starting from the mouth going into the esophagus coming into the stomach then moving into the small intestine and comes to the large intestine ultimately it will go into rectum rectum to anus so this is a complete tube like network so that is why it is also called as gut or tube here it's like a tube structure okay which has two openings so you have tube within tube body plan as there are two external openings one is the mouth other is the anus hope you understood this so let us talk about in detail about the alimentary canal so alimentary canal starts with the mouth or the buccal cavity and this buccal cavity will have the teeth and muscular tongue so it will have teeth and muscular tongue so what type of teeth you have you have thicodon teeth what do you mean by thicodon teeth thicodon teeth means the teeth is going to be fixed inside a socket okay this is the bone in which your teeth is placed inside the socket so this is your teeth this is the crown part of tooth and this is the root part of the tooth this is the gingiva or the gums gingiva or gum and here is the bone in which the tooth is fixed inside this is called as alveolar bone or it is also called as jaw bone is it okay with you so teeth is fixed inside the socket so when teeth is fixed inside the socket of jaw bone socket of jaw bone it is called thicodont condition so thicodont condition is found in crocodiles also please remember apart from mammals these thicodont teeth are also found in crocodiles you also have bunodont teeth you can see you will be you will have is have been sim similarity with this teeth your teeth are just like this these are called as bunodont teeth because you have the cusp as rounded ones so when you have rounded cusp in your premolars and molars it is called as bunodont teeth so bunodont teeth is a characteristic of mammals okay not all mammals especially the humans and the rabbits all have the bunodont teeth okay they have rounded cusp but if you talk about the tigers lions they have pointed cusp so they are cecodont and sheep and goat they will have the cecodont cusp different different cusp are there okay so you have bunodont teeth these kind of teeth which are premolars and molars they are called as cheek teeth so bunodont teeth is a type of modification of cheek teeth so cheek teeth is premolars plus molars okay now humans have humans have brachiodont teeth brachiodont teeth means your crown is not very high it's not you know increase in the length so you have low crown teeth that's why you you have 
ब्रेक्योडॉन टीथ तो ब्रेक्योडॉन टीथ आर द वंस विच आर लो क्राउंड ओके द क्राउन साइज इज नॉट वेरी मींस एनलार्ज्ड बट इन केस ऑफ सपोज हॉर्सेस व्हिच हैव द हिप्सोडॉन टीथ यू कैन सी दे हैव द हिप्सोडॉन टीथ द क्राउन इज क्वाइट एनलार्ज्ड सो व्हेन अ क्राउन साइज इज क्वाइट एनलार्ज it is called as hypsodont teeth okay maybe i have written the spelling wrong here so hypsodont teeth is found in what horses so horses have hypsodont teeth their crown size is quite enlarged in them okay so please remember this it's not given in ncert but maybe sometimes you may ask okay so there are some questions they have asked previously also yes now you see humans have diaphyodont teeth what do you mean by diaphyodont teeth are they replaced twice in life or once in life so they are replaced once in life replaced once in lifetime but two sets of teeth present in lifetime present in lifetime what are those two sets of teeth one is the milk teeth and other is the permanent teeth one is milk teeth or the deciduous teeth and other is your permanent teeth let's see how you can see here the set of permanent the set of permanent teeth here and here is the deciduous or the milk teeth so deciduous of the milk teeth they are going to be replaced but the permanent set of teeth will remain there for the lifetime okay so let's see how so in which are which are the first teeth to come in a human child that is central incisors as you can see around 6 to 8 months these kind of you know, these kind of teeth are appearing first central incisors are to appear first in human dentition that is by around 6 to 8 months after that you see around lateral incisors come then the canines then the molars but you don't find premolars here so premolars are absent in the dentition that is milk dentition premolars absent in milk dentition okay now let's see so till 6 years you the child will have this kind of these kind of teeth they will not have the premolars but the first premolars will appear okay the first molar sorry will appear around the 6 to 7 years so from here you see from the 6th year the permanent set of teeth has started coming so permanent set of teeth starts coming by around 6 to 7 years after that you can see around 7 years central incisors come lateral incisors come by 8 years so all these teeth will come but the last molar that is the third molar will come very late around 17 years of age this tooth appears that is also called wisdom tooth that comes by around 17 years or it may appear later also so 17 years till 25th year these this tooth can come and sometimes it doesn't come also because the jaw bone of humans is receding inside so maybe it may not erupt so don't think that someone is not having the wisdom tooth so he is not having the wisdom also it is not such okay so let us continue further now and see the dental heterodont condition different type of teeth are present in humans which is called as heterodont condition so heterodont condition means they have different type of teeth incisors canines premolars and molars here you can see incisors canines premolars and molars so incisors they have only one root roots present in incisors are only one one root canines also they will have one root in the upper and lower premolars will have two roots in the upper one upper premolars will have two roots okay and lower premolars will have the one root whereas molars if we talk about this will have three roots in the upper molars 
and lower molars will have the two roots okay so this is all about just the information on how many types of roots will be present in upper or lower canines or premolars or molars okay so this different type of sets of teeth which are present different types of teeth which are present they constitute heterodont condition which is a characteristic feature of mammals and humans got it now comes the dental formula so dental formula is actually the arrangement of teeth in such a way that you will calculate the half the one half set in the upper jaw and one half set in the lower jaw so this arrangement of teeth in which each half of upper and lower jaw in the specific order of incisors canine premolar and molar will be shown that is called as dental formula for example dental formula of human adult is simply if we say 2 1 2 3 divided by 2 1 2 3 what does it mean so this is incisor i stands for incisors so in the this sequence only this is the order in which it is written incisors canine premolars and molars so it has two incisors in the upper half one canine in the upper half or lower half premolars are two and molars are three so this is how the dental formula is written so this is one half of the jaw jaw bone upper and lower you have to multiply by 2 and you get the 32 teeth as the complete set okay now dental formula of milk teeth so as you know the milk teeth are absent in the milk teeth the premolars are absent so dental formula will be what 2102 upon 2102 so you see it clearly indicates so what is absent here premolars are absent okay so premolars are absent in the case of milk teeth clear so total teeth will be around 20 in this you have to multiply by 2 here also and 2 here also so you get 20 teeth in the milk dentition now dental formula of 17 year old if you write 17 year old so as we talked about 17 year old may have wisdom tooth or may not have okay so 17 year old if i write it may have wisdom tooth or may not have so let us do one thing let us write 15 year now let us write 15 year so 15 year old if i write that means wisdom tooth will not be there rest other teeth he will have so it will be 2 1 2 2 upon 2 1 2 2 that means the wisdom tooth has not come rest all other teeth are there but wisdom tooth has still not come here correct so this set of teeth will have around 28 teeth is it okay clear now suppose one more question comes what is the dental formula of monophyodont teeth so what are you going to write about think over it dental formula of monophyodont teeth in humans monophyodont teeth in humans let us think about it see the monophyodont teeth were the premolars and the one molar which came only for the one time they came only once in life so this is 0021 upon 0021 that means premolars two premolars in the upper set and lower set and one molar came for the first one time only in life so these were these are always monophyodont teeth in humans so that comes to around 12 teeth because 20 teeth were the one which was present in the milk teeth dentition and the ones which came only once in life they were the mono pyodon teeth hope is it clear with you now so let us continue further with the tooth structure now as you can see the exposed part of the tooth is called as crown and in between you have some neck in which you find the gingiva that is your gums and a deep inside 
the structure which is placed inside is the root so let us talk about the tooth structure so teeth will have the tooth or the teeth will have two major components one is the hard tissue other is the soft tissue so one component is the hard tissue of the teeth and other component is your soft tissue so what is the soft tissue component and the hard tissue component let's see hard tissue will be enamel it will be dentine and the cementum so these are a component of hard tissue whereas soft tissue includes the pulp cavity and it includes the periodontal membrane hope you are understanding my point what i'm talking about so they are the soft tissues whereas the hard tissue is your enamel dentine and cementum these are the enamel dentine and cementum these three are the component of hard tissue of teeth so let us talk one by one enamel enamel is ectodermal in origin this is ectodermal in origin it arises from the stem cells called ameloblast ameloblast are the stem cells which produce this okay enamel is a hardest substance in the body hardest substance okay this contains some hydroxy apatite salts and it is harder than the bone also clear dentine dentine forms bulk of the tooth this forms bulk of tooth formed from odontoblasts so odontoblasts are the stem cells which form the dentine are you able to understand dentine is mesodermal in origin mesodermal in origin it forms the bulk of tooth that also you should know okay now this is all what we are talking about is about the structure inside the tooth but this which is the structure which will have the living component so living component will be found in the pulp cavity you can see in the pulp cavity the blood vessels the nerves are entering inside can you see this is the pulp cavity in this you can see the nerves blood vessels lymph vessels all are entering and they are entering through a aperture called as apical foramen so through the apical foramen these all nerves blood vessels have entered okay so this is the living component and this is a soft tissue pulp cavity which has uh, all those structures inside is it okay yes so let us continue further and talk more about the other components also so this was about the tooth sometimes you know what happens is the bacteria also starts you know producing some its uh, toxins here and then this gets degenerated so enamel if it gets degenerate if it gets uh, harmed it will not be regenerated so enamel is non regenerable it can't regenerate non regenerable but dentine can be regenerated this can be regenerated hope you understood my point moreover one last point you see periodontal ligaments so you can see here some whitish color structures these whitish color structures are actually the sharpies fibers which are a component of the periodontal ligaments and they contain collagen they contain collagen and these hold the tooth they are attaching the cementum and the bone of the tooth together so that the tooth should be placed at this position fixed at this position and sometimes when vitamin c is less so because vitamin c has the you know role in the collagen synthesis you know that or not vitamin c has role in collagen synthesis so when vitamin c is less the collagen synthesis gets disrupted and then this weakens these fibers do weaken and they can cause a disease called scurvy in which bleeding from the gums takes place 
okay and further it can lead to much more dis diseases also even sometimes the periodontal membrane gets inflamed that is called periodontitis okay so let us continue further and talk about some other uh, you know things also now this you can see tusk so these are the tusk in elephant so are they modified incisors or modified canines yes you got it right these are the modified upper incisors so modified upper incisors are the tusk of elephant the tusk of elephant are modified upper incisors now tell me tusk of walrus are they modified incisors or modified upper canine so these are tusks of walrus if you see they are modified upper canines but tusk of elephant these are modified upper incisors please remember these things because sometimes these questions have asked have been asked now one more thing this is open type of teeth because this can grow continuously this grows throughout life so this is called as open type of teeth but we and you have closed type of teeth okay let's talk about the tongue now tongue is completely and completely a muscular organ tongue is composed of is skeletal muscles only this has is skeletal muscles so you can see the tongue can move by your will power it will not move unnecessarily okay so it has what it has got skeletal muscles tongue is very important for your swallowing purpose for a speech purpose and even it helps in mastication so tongue helps in it helps in mastication it also helps in swallowing it also helps in speech if tongue is not there you can't speak so this is speech also is it okay so tongue is helping you in mastication swallowing and speech the tongue is held in the floor of the buccal cavity by a structure called lingual frenulum so the structure which is holding it in the floor of the buccal cavity is the lingual frenulum where the lips if you talk about the lips lips are held by a frenulum called labial frenulum tongue is held by lingual frenulum please remember this point okay tongue has some papillae so tongue has papillae what are papillae these papillae you can see these four types of papillae are present okay human tongue you can see the four types of papillae one is fungi form papillae fungi form papillae are mushroom shaped papillae these are mushroom shaped papillae if you see talk about fili form they are most numerous most numerous are the fili form but they lack taste buds taste buds are absent because usually the papillae will have the taste buds but in this case taste buds are absent circumvallate papillae these are the largest largest papillae okay they are meant for bitter sense they are found in the posterior region you can see here posterior region foliate papillae you can see here foliate papillae these are vestigial in human vestigial in humans okay so foliate papillae they are vestigial in humans but circumvallate papillae you can see here in the posterior end whereas filiform papillae they are found mostly maximum on the tongue and fungi form papillae are the mushroom shaped red color papillae one very important point you see there is a structure which divides this tongue into two parts and that you know division the structure which divides the tongue into two parts is called as sulcus terminalis this is the sulcus terminalis so what does the sulcus terminalis do it has divided the tongue into two parts so this part is called as pharyngeal part okay 
or the posterior part whereas this part the anterior part is called as the oral part or the anterior part okay here you see some opening also so the, this opening is called as foramen cecum what is the foramen cecum foramen cecum is actually the remnant of thyroglossal duct this is the remnant of thyroglossal duct which was present in the embryo okay so this remnant is now present which is called as foramen cecum let us continue further and talk about those taste buds which we were talking about so tongue has papillae on papillae you have the taste buds papillae have the taste buds let's see how these are papillae and these papillae you see they have some taste pores here can you see the papillae has some depression which is called taste pore and these taste pore inside the taste pore you see some taste buds so that means anything which you taste should be in the liquid form or should be in the soluble form so that has to be in soluble form and it has to go inside here okay then only you will be able to taste it here you see when the liquid goes inside so there are some microvilli here so those microvilli are going to you know take the sense of the liquid or the dissolved substance and then it is going to send the signals to the brain so those signals will be received by the brain so you have five types of taste okay taste types are five types as you know one is a sweet other is sour next is a salty next is bitter and the last one is the umami okay one point here you see taste buds have nerve innervation so cranial nerves cranial nerves that is your seventh that is facial okay ninth that is your glossopharyngeal glossopharyngeal is your ninth cranial nerve and the tenth that is your vagus these cranial nerves sub are supplying those innervations to the taste buds so taste buds are supplied with innervations from cranial nerve 7th 9th and 10th okay so this was little bit about the taste buds now we talk about the palate palate is divided into two uh, parts that is hard palate and the soft palate so why we call it as hard palate and the soft palate hard palate definitely will be hard and it will have some bones whereas you won't find the bones in the soft palate so let's see what is hard palate hard palate has some bones like palatine maxillae premaxillae bones and you can see some palatine rugae also palatine rugae okay are present so hard palate has bones inside there are palatine bones maxillae premaxillae and this hard palate separates the nasal passage from the oral passage okay from the oral passage because otherwise how what was the reason of development of hard palate if this hard palate wouldn't have come in you you wouldn't have been able to breathe while eating something so that is the function of hard palate so this secondary palate or the hard palate appeared for the first time in crocodiles please remember this appeared in first time in crocodiles and it separates the nasal passage from the oral passage soft palate consists uvula this consists of uvula now this uvula helps in closing the internal nares closing the internal nares during 
swallowing okay so let's see how can you see this structure this is structure is the uvula when you just eat something when you swallow something that moves up and closes your internal nares so that the air should not go at the same time when you are swallowing only the food should go in that passage at the time otherwise it can have some problem in the you know epiglottis so the reflex action is there so both things should not go at the same time that is why this uvula will go up and close the internal nares during the swallowing process hope you understood this well now let's continue further now the component that is pharynx so pharynx is a common passage for food and air but which part of the pharynx is the common passage for food and air let's see there are three parts one is nasopharynx other is oropharynx and third is your laryngopharynx so please remember pharynx has three parts one is the nasopharynx which is actually a part of the nasal passage next comes the oropharynx and this is the one which we are talking about is the common passage for food and air next comes the laryngopharynx but in ncert they have written because they don't want to make you more confused so they have you know simplified it that pharynx is a common chamber for the food and air because this is the only part you see the food is going in the oropharynx it is not going in the nasopharynx so food comes in the oropharynx where the air also comes here okay so this is the only common chamber for the food and air okay after that the laryngopharynx is there which leads to the esophagus other structures also you can see this is a hard palate here this is the uvula which is the part of the soft palate okay let's continue now comes the esophagus esophagus is a long tube it is around 25 cm long and it has it pierces the diaphragm so it pierces the diaphragm at around t10 what is t10 that is the 10th thoracic vertebrae at the region of 10th thoracic vertebrae this is going to pierce the diaphragm region so diaphragm is going to be pierced at this region and that esophagus is going to come inside go inside and join the first part of the stomach that is the cardia part so you see the first part of the stomach it joins here cardia and here you find the lower esophageal sphincter lower esophageal sphincter is going to control the opening of the esophagus into the cardia part of the stomach okay that is also called as gastroesophageal sphincter les is also called gastroesophageal sphincter okay because it is between the gastric region and the esophagus now you see the esophagus is supplied by nerve also that is called vagus nerve 10th cranial nerve supplies this esophagus esophagus upper 1 by 3 part is voluntary upper 1 by 3 part of esophagus is voluntary that means you can control it during swallowing whereas lower 2 by 3 part is involuntary where the peristalsis goes on so here peristalsis will go okay moreover the visceral peritoneum or the serosa is absent in esophagus so esophagus serosa is absent outermost layer is outermost layer is the tunica adventitia that is a fibrous tissue tunica adventitia that is a fibrous tissue hope you understood this well the esophagus one disease sometimes happens sometimes this part okay comes out in this region here because of some injury or something at that time that is called hiatal hernia that is called as hiatal hernia when some part of the stomach and the esophagus comes out of those diaphragm region that can happen due to extreme injury there 
दैट इज कॉल्ड हियाटल हर्निया ओके सो लेट्स टॉक अबाउट द हिस्टोलॉजी ऑफ एलिमेंट्री कनाल हिस्टोलॉजी of the elementary canal you can see outermost layer is the serosa so outermost layer is your serosa this is outermost layer this is also called as mesothelium this is the mesothelium or it is also called as the visceral peritoneum so this is actually a squamous epithelium only so this is visceral peritoneum so this serosa has some connective tissue also also has some connective tissues okay now this comes the muscularis externa the next layer is the muscularis externa in the muscularis externa outer muscles are longitudinal and inner muscles are the circular inner muscles are circular outer are the longitudinal these are the longitudinal got it here you see the inside the muscular layer there is a submucosa submucosa will have the blood vessels the blood vessels the connective tissues connective tissue and even it will have the nerves and the lymph vessels also so this is very important even in some regions in duodenum in duodenum in duodenum it has glands called bruner's gland okay so they are called as bruner's gland so bruner's gland are found in the submucosa of duodenum in the this is the mucosa layer mucosa is the inner most layer this is the inner most layer so this also has some made further divisions which we'll talk now this is the inside lumen so let us see the mucosa layer inner most layer what divisions are more inside this mucosa so let us see this is the mucosa layer you can see this is the inner most layer called mucosa you can see some glands also in the mucosa so this is the mucosa layer which has the epithelium layer this epithelium mucus epithelium is modified modified as rugae in case of a stomach rugae in the stomach and in case of as villi in intestine in intestine it is modified as villi next comes the lamina propria this is the connective tissue connective tissue is the lamina propria inside here and after that you can see some again the muscularis mucosa layer the muscularis mucosa will have again outer longitudinal muscles and inner circular muscles so inner circular and outer longitudinal muscles are found in the muscularis mucosa lymphoid tissue is present throughout this in this you can see lymphoid tissue is present even some glands also mucosa has glands mucosa has mucosa has some glands also which are the glands like gastric glands like gastric and intestinal glands you got it so intestinal glands and gastric glands are present in the mucosa layer okay you can see here this is the gland okay clear to you now one very important point you should know that between the external that is muscularis externa external muscle layer that is the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscles which were there in the external muscularis that is muscularis externa okay muscularis externa this is the muscularis externa so in between these two muscles circular and longitudinal you can see some plexus here 
so this plexus is called myantric plexus so this myantric plexus is very important to understand here myantric plexus is also called as or back plexus this is also called as or back plexus where it is present present between outer longitudinal and circular muscles and circular muscles of muscularis externa muscularis externa okay so in between that you find the nerve plexus and this nerve plexus what it is the purpose of this this plexus is meant for this is meant for meant for peristalsis so peristalsis will require the coordination of the longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles so this is going to be controlled by the myantric plexus got it now just below the circular muscle just below the circular muscle also you find there is one plexus called as mesonar's plexus or submucosal plexus you can see here submucosal plexus submucosal plexus is also called as this is also called as mesonar's plexus so mesonar's plexus is also called as sub mucosal plexus okay so what is the role of this plexus it helps in secretion of digestive juices okay so this plexus is going to help in the secretion of digestive juices got it so please write down mesonar's plexus helps in secretion of digestive juices okay just for your reference i have written it but you can easily understand here okay that's it for this uh, histology let us continue further and talk about a very important disease called heart burn so don't think that heart has got burned or don't think also this is a disorder of circulatory system it is a disorder of this is a disorder of digestive system you can see something he is eating and he is having problem in during that only it does not that he has got heart attack sometimes patient go to doctors and they complain of heart attack when they have the heart burn so what is heart burn let us see first this you see this is what this is the esophagus which is entering into the stomach region and the stomach region you see here is the esophagus this is the esophagus here and this esophagus is entering the stomach first part that is cardia so this is the cardia part of the stomach okay this sphincter is called as les that is lower esophageal sphincter okay now this lower esophageal sphincter is also called as gastroesophageal sphincter this is also called gastroesophageal sphincter okay now what happens when the food comes here this is the food is coming here this is the bolus which is coming here so there's a peristalsis going on so the food is coming here you see food is traveling and coming the bolus is coming here so it will reach here now okay so this food has reached here so now the food has to enter so when the food has to enter it has to relax so when the les will relax the food will enter correct so if if it fails to we will talk about two conditions 
if it fails to if this fails to if les fails to relax suppose it doesn't relax properly so will the food go inside no that causes that causes you know there the food will get it you know accumulated for a long time here and it will cause some halitosis and it will cause a disease called achalasia cardia achalasia cardia is a disease caused when this fails to relax you understood fails to relax but this has to close suppose this was normal relaxing it was relaxing normally but when it has to contract now because the food has gone into the cardia the food has come here now it has to contract so this is not contracting properly now you see if it fails to contract then the disease produce will be the hard burn because the acidic content can can now enter in the esophagus so if it fails to contract it causes heart burn it causes heart burn that means in this part in this region there will be acute pain and patient will think that it is what heart attack but it is actually a case of what heart burn clear understood yes so let us continue further and talk about the stomach region stomach has some extra muscles apart from the outer longitudinal and inner circular it has some special muscle called oblique layer in the muscularis externa in the muscularis externa it has some extra layer here you can see oblique muscles so oblique muscles will help them to you know go for more of churning process which is always required in the stomach region moreover the different parts of the stomach we'll talk about stomach has four parts one is the cardia next is the fundus third is body and fourth is your pylorus so one by one you can see here also fundus this is the cardia part this is the cardia and this is the body this is your pylorus four parts you can see in the stomach region okay here you see the stomach shape stomach shape you always remember it is j shaped it is located on the left portion of the abdominal cavity okay this is a j shaped bag so when j shaped bag it is there so one side you will have more concavity that is called greater curvature and you will have much more convexity one side that is called lesser curvature okay moreover you can see when the stomach is empty empty stomach will show some folds shows longitudinal folds please remember it shows longitudinal folds what are those longitudinal folds these are the ones which we call them as rugae understood so these empty folds longitudinal folds are the ones which are called as rugae these are also modification of what mucosa epithelium remember we talked about that these are modification of mucosal epithelium is it okay now food remains in the stomach for around 4 to 5 hours and if you take some more fatty food that can remain for around 5 to 6 hours also okay so let us talk about and you can see here the cardio esophageal sphincter that means when the esophagus is joining the cardia part this sphincter is also called cardio esophageal sphincter or it is also called as les that is lower esophageal sphincter or gastro esophageal sphincter which we just now talked about let's talk about the small intestine small intestine is called a small intestine because of the less of diameter than the large intestine it has three major parts one is a duodenum next is jejunum and third is your ileum ileum is characterized by pears patches characterized by pears patches pears patches 
दीज आर एग्रीगेट्स ऑफ लिम्फॉइड टिश्यू एग्रीगेट्स ऑफ लिम्फॉइड टिश्यू तो वेर एवर यू फाइंड द लिम्फॉइड टिश्यू एग्रीगेट्स पेयर स्पैचेस यू वॉन्ट फाइंड द विलाय इन दैट रीजन जेजुनम इज ऑल्सो वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इट हैज मैक्सिमम विलाय तो मैक्सिमम विलाय विल बी प्रेजेंट इन द जेजुनम एंड ड्योडनम हैज ओपनिंग ऑफ ओपनिंग ऑफ हिपैटो पैंक्रियाटिक हिपैटो पैंक्रियाटिक डक्ट विच इज गवर्न बाय द स्प्रिंटर ऑफ ओडाई ओके सो वील टॉक अबाउट ऑल दीज यू नो लेयर्स इन डिटेल द पार्ट्स इन डिटेल डोंट वरी सो लेट एस कंटिन्यू फर्दर नाउ विद द characteristics of the small intestine so a small intestine is characterized by the presence of circular folds so these circular folds are called as plique circulaire or valves of kerkering so don't get worried about valves of kerkering it's a big term don't get worried it is just simple it is just circular folds you can see here circular folds folds are there simple so these circular folds have been named the terminology in the medicine is plique circular or the valves of kerkering big big terms but it is what only circular folds simple you remember circular folds villi and microvilli are present here so that they increase the surface area do you know the plique circular plique circular increases the increases surface area by three times that is three times the surface area is increased three times it is increased by plique circular villi will increase the surface area by 10 times and when you have more microvilli on that so ultimately it is going to increase 20 times so now you can think how much times have the surface area got increased okay surface area would have got increased so many times now because of presence of plique circular villi and microvilli you can see okay pears patches we already talked about these are aggregates of the lymphoid tissue in the ileum okay you can see here pears patches which are found here aggregates of the lymphoid tissue now the question comes to you the lymphoid tissue is found in which part of the intestine is it jejunum ileum or the duodenum or all of these so you have to go for all of these because lymphoid tissue is present in all but aggregates of lymphoid tissue which is called pears patches that is only found in ileum but lymphoid tissue is present throughout the gut that is called malt so lymphoid tissue lymphoid tissue that is malt mucosa associated lymphoid tissue mucosa associated lymphoid tissue okay this is very important this forms around 50% of all your immune system so mucosa associated lymphoid tissue is the malt okay present in entire gut is it okay with you is it clear now and in fact uh the uh, study is some researchers you know they show that you have some kind of gut brain also and that is why when you uh, are on the stage or something then some butterflies happen in your stomach region that is because of some coordination between the brain and the you know gut region so there is a gut brain which has been almost researched by harvard medical school also so you can just find those uh, you know papers which have been published by harvard medical school anyway let's talk about what is in your syllabus first so large intestine now so large intestine it has much more diameter as compared to the small intestine it has major three parts one is the cecum which is a small blind sac like a structure next is the colon which has around four parts 
for divisions that is ascending colon transverse colon descending and sigmoid colon then comes a rectum which has some you know rectal papillae and it is going to continue further with the anal canal and the anus and you can see some large intestine here how it is being held okay by some during surgery let's see the characteristic features of large intestine so large intestine is characterized by tinea coli what is tinea coli these are three longitudinal bands okay muscle bands you can say these are muscle bands three longitudinal muscle bands which are going throughout the large intestine can you see yes the, their number is three so when these okay pouches developing during the during contraction of tinea coli so you see now this tinea coli what happens this gets a little bit contracted okay and it causes what it causes the development of those hostra you know pouch like structures so the entire large intestine you can see some pouch like structures here okay epiploic appendages these are kind of fat tissues okay fat tissues in the visceral peritoneum you can see here small fat filled pouches of visceral peritoneum that hang from the tinea coli so fat tissue pouches okay fat filled pouches fat tissue pouches which are in the visceral peritoneum okay which are hanging from the tinea coli you can see they are hanging from the tinea coli here these are called epiploic appendages clear to you all those three characteristics how you can differentiate the large intestine from the small intestine you have you understood now okay let's continue further some parts of large intestine which were about to talk about that is cecum cecum is a blind sac like structure you can see here blind sac like structure is cecum and here is the opening of the ileo cecal valve is here which is opening here so ileum of the small intestine is going to come and join the cecum part where you find the ileo cecal valves okay now this cecum is blind sac like structure that means after that there is nothing here so this blind sac like structure it hosts some symbiotic microorganisms which are the ones which are helpful to produce some vitamins like vitamin k vitamin b12 that is being produced by those microorganisms okay so there are terms like prebiotics probiotics and now the new term has come that is called postbiotics so write in the chat box do you know about postbiotics so one is prebiotic okay you should know about the difference in this prebiotics probiotics and next is the postbiotics okay so these are the new this is a new term which has come now postbiotics anyway we will not talk about this in detail let's continue further so this is the finger like a structure coming out of the cecum here you can see that is a appendix so this is a finger like a structure called as appendix so this appendix actually has lymphatic tissue so now tell me one thing will you like to remove something which has got is still got lymphatic tissue which is helping in immunity yes when there's a inflammation of appendix so first doctors will try to make that recover giving by antibiotics in that region and all but if it doesn't recover well so they may go for removing of this surgically that is called appendicitis which is the inflammation of appendix is called as appendicitis okay so inflammation inflammation of appendix is called as appendicitis this is called appendicitis okay but sometimes the inflammation goes much beyond that uh, you know imagination and it bursts sometimes you know it, it burst so when the bust you know rupture of when rupture of 
appendix happens that is much more dangerous then so rupture of appendix causes much more dangerous disease called peritonitis why it is called peritonitis there's a reason because when the rupture of appendix will happen so the all those germs which were there you know all those bacteria which were there they will start you know to, uh, they will get get thrown in the ne nearby region and that will cause the inflammation of the nearby peritoneal linings so that will be much more dangerous you know that has to be controlled by some giving some high antibiotics high dose antibiotics okay so that is called peritonitis is it okay with you now let's talk about the colon part now colon has four parts as i told you one is the ascending colon next is your descending colon third is your transverse and fourth is the sigmoid so it is ascending colon this is the transverse colon this is the descending colon and this is the s shaped structure called sigmoid colon so sigmoid colon is s shaped colon okay ascending colon this lacks any kind of mesentery very important this lacks mesentery ascending colon doesn't has mesentery because it is already held na in that region so it doesn't require also mesentery anyway the right flexure you can see the right side has a hepatic flexure there is a liver and the left side you will have the spleen so you have the splenic flexure in this part okay so descending colon is below the splenic flexure here and transverse colon is below the pancreas okay now comes the rectum in the rectum you see this rectum has some rectal veins so sometimes varicosity okay which opens out to the anus so varicosity varicosity of rectal veins sometimes happens and this is called as hemorrhoids now what are hemorrhoids hemorrhoids is formally called as bleeding pipe so this can happen due to what varicosity of the rectal vein hope you understood well now last one is the anus so this anal region you see it has two sphincters one is the inner okay internal sphincter one is the external sphincter internal sphincter will be involuntary external sphincter will be voluntary okay it will be controlled by our will power next comes the digestive glands so just the major types of digestive glands are di the salivary glands liver and the pancreas so these are the associated digestive glands along with the alimentary canal they also help in what digestion of food so let us start with our first that is salivary glands so three pairs of salivary glands are present in human three pairs of salivary glands so one is the parotid this is the largest salivary gland just below the ears you can see this just below the ears this is the largest salivary gland called as parotid you can see here so parotid gland is the largest salivary gland and it secretes only 20% 20% of saliva okay 20% of saliva comes from the parotid gland parotid gland secrete salivary amylase so salivary amylase or the ptyalin comes from the parotid gland okay duct associated is the tensions duct so you can see tensions duct carries the secretion of the parotid gland and it opens near the central you know uh, second upper second molar you can see upper second molar opens ducts opens near upper second molar teeth okay second upper near the upper second molar teeth it the duct will open there uh, secreted secretion sometimes the parotid gland they get inflamed by a virus so that is called a disease called mum in mums parotid gland gets inflamed by paramyxovirus 
okay so paramyxovirus when inflammation of the paramyxovirus happens on this parotid glands the disease is called mumps okay the, the swelling of that cheek region will happen okay okay let's move to the next type of salivary gland that is a sub maxillary or the sub mandibular so just low near the angle of the jaw you'll find this sub maxillary or the sub mandibular salivary glands they secrete maximum saliva they secrete 70 percent of saliva okay so they secrete around 70 percent of saliva and the duct associated is the duct associated will be Wharton's duct Wharton's duct opens near the central incisors opens near central incisors which one upper or lower lower central incisor or upper central incisor it will be lower central incisors okay sublingual sublingual if i talk about it will be below the tongue as it says a sublingual sublingual is below the tongue and moreover it is not one duct coming out there are many ducts sublingual ducts they should write many many ducts you can see one two three four so many ducts are going so it's a combination of so many drug i mean ducts many ducts are going and opening in that region okay so the major duct major duct will be the ravenous duct here but there are many ducts which are opening here okay so many ducts are going to open in that region so let's continue further so let's talk about the composition of saliva here so saliva contains water which is 99.5 percent 99.5 percent water is present in the saliva saliva has very important antibodies that is iga which prevent you from the you know diseases they, they prevent you from the pathogens they provide you some defense okay now saliva also contains some you know some components like ions like sodium ions potassium ions chloride ions and bicarbonate ions in which chloride ions are very important for the functioning of the enzyme that is salivary amylase so this is always required for the activation of the salivary amylase enzyme mucus is always there for lubrication and that is why the bolus is formed in that region lysozyme and the thiocyanate ions have the antibacterial properties these are present in the saliva to give you antibacterial property okay now salivary amylase is called as tylen which digests only 30 percent starch in buccal cavity in buccal cavity digestion of only 30 percent starch takes place here okay so let's talk about the very important gland that is liver so liver is found on the right hand side right side of the body and its weight is around 1.2 to 1.5 kgs it has two major lobes two major lobes and these two lobes are held by a ligament which is called falciform ligament so two main lobes are there which is the left lobe and the right lobe otherwise there are two more lobes under the in the right lobe that is caudate and quadrate but you remember only two major lobes that is left and right lobes these two lobes are held together by a falciform ligament this is important to question okay now you see if you talk about the structural and functional unit of liver it is hepatic lobule so let us see one structure of hepatic lobule it is the structural and functional unit of liver please remember and this is covered by each lobule is covered by glissons capsule so you have one lobule here which is covered by a connective tissue complete that's called glissons capsule so this is the glissons capsule okay this is the glissons capsule and this is the liver okay hepatic lobule you can say liver instead of liver you can write hepatic lobule so this is the hepatic lobule and it is covered by the connective tissue called glissons capsule okay so let's see here this is the hepatic lobule 
which you can see it is hexagonal in shape here and you can see many lobules and in each lobule you will find one central vein so one central vein is present in each lobule each lobule will have one central vein and these central veins are going to dump to uh, come together and form those they will dump those uh, content in the hepatic vein that is going to lead to the inferior vena cava and ultimately to the heart so let us see further more details you can see the portal triads also on each and every corner of this hepatic lobule you can see portal triads so what does this portal triad contains let's see portal triad contains one branch of the hepatic artery one branch of the hepatic artery one branch of the hepatic that is bile duct and one branch of the hepatic portal vein so these three together here are forming the hepatic portal triad and you can see each corner each corner of that hepatic lobule will find the portal triad okay and in between in between you will find the central vein okay central vein is in the between here in the middle of that you will find the central vein clear so here you see portal triad is composed of what one hepatic artery one portal vein and one bile ductule branch so what are they is going to do the bile ductules you see they are going to collect the bile here and ultimately they'll dump those you know content in the herring's canal and the herring's canal will take it to the interlobular bile ducts okay moreover this all these hepatic artery is going to supply the blood to it and hepatic portal vein is going to carry the nutrient the nutrient loaded blood is going to be taken to the liver and sinusoids are there which have some kaffir cells also sinusoids have some kaffir cells in that okay which are going to protect you from the pathogens okay any pathogen enters in that area it will be protected by the kaffir cells so these are modified macrophages these are modified macrophages okay and those all central veins will lead to the hepatic vein and that will be leading it to the inferior vena cava so the all central vein central veins going to dump into the hepatic veins and hepatic vein is going to take it to what inferior vena cava ivc that is inferior vena cava okay and bile ducts are going to take into the herring's canal herring's canal to enter lobular bile duct let's talk about the functions of liver there are around more than 500 functions of liver but few of them we'll talk about here so let's see production of bile is the function of liver here even you know urea production takes place here only in the liver it is removed from the kidneys but production of urea takes place in the liver only carbohydrate metabolism that is glycogenesis gluconeogenesis is going to be controlled by the liver only synthesis of plasma proteins like fibrinogen and all will take place in the liver only yolk synthesis okay yolk synthesis also takes place in the liver whereas the hemopoiesis of the fetus fetus fetal stage hemopoiesis will take place in the liver in the embryonic stage it may take place in the yolk sac detoxification of the prussic acid which is harmful it has to be detoxified so major organ for detoxification is your liver only storage of minerals vitamins fats glycogen and even iron is stored in ferritin form in liver only synthesis of vitamin a and vitamin d will take place in the liver and synthesis of anticoagulant called heparin also takes place in the liver you can say here how the component and uv light is coming and falling on the skin so a skin has one component called 7 d hydroxy cholesterol this will form the pre vitamin d that is called colsi colicalciprol and this is going to come in liver so from liver and kidneys this ultimately is going to form the calcitriol the active form of the vitamin d so please remember liver has also got a role in synthesis of vitamin d also so vitamin a and vitamin d also okay so few points you have to remember nothing to worry 
Now, production of bile we talked about is an important function of liver. Now, what does this bile contain? Bile does not contain any enzyme. Does not, doesn't contain any enzyme. So, what it what it does? What is the use of this then? See, it is very important for the emulsification of fats. And bile has some bacteriostatic functions also. So, bile contains two pigments here which is biliverdin and bilirubin okay and they have some bile salts also like sodium glycolate glycolate and sodium taurocolate okay sodium glycolate sodium taurocolate so these all are what the bile salts which are very important for the emulsification of fats. So bile helps in what? Emulsification of fats. Without that, it is not possible for fats to be, you know, digested and absorbed. Cholesterol and phospholipids are present in bile, but no enzymes are present in bile. Bile also activates lipases. Very, very important point here, which is given in NCRT. So bile is the only one which is going to activate lipases. Otherwise, Digestion of fats is not possible anyway. Okay. And even bile has bacteriostatic function. So you can write that also. Bile has bacteriostatic function also. Bacteriostatic function. This is also very important as some question has come in some exam. Okay. So let's continue further. So we were talking about the pancreas now. Pancreas is a heterocrine gland. It is found between the limbs of the C-shaped duodenum. Here you see the two components are the endocrine part and the exocrine part. Okay. So endocrine part is going to secrete the hormones and exocrine part is going to secrete the enzymes. Okay. So exocrine part and endocrine part we will see. So pancreatic SNI is a exocrine part. Here it is exocrine part. Whereas if we talk about the endocrine part, they are the islet of Langerhan. So here you see pancreatic SNI is a exocrine part. You can see here these are SNS. These are going to produce the enzymes. And they are the ma in majority, these are present. Only islets of Langerhan are only one million in number. One or one or few million in numbers only. Almost one million. So these pancreatic SNI are going to, going to produce the proenzymes which are the trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase. Even they are going to produce some enzymes like amylase that is pancreatic amylase and the RNAs and DNAs which are both are called nucleases. So these both are called as nucleases and pancreatic lipase also comes from the SNR cells. So SNR cells are involved in the production of enzymes. What is the pancreatic juice pH? That will be more than 7. It is 7.8 to 8.4. Okay. This can vary from 7.8 to 8.4. The endocrine part we will see. This is the endocrine part. So endocrine part of the islet of Langerhans is the islet of Langerhans. So they produce some hormones like alpha cells produces glucagon, beta cells produce insulin, delta cells produces somatostatin and PP cells produces the pancreatic polypeptide. So this is endocrine part which we will discuss in the chemical coordination chapter. Okay. So let's continue further with the intestinal glands now. So intestinal glands are characterized by the Brunner's gland and the crypts of liver cohen. You can see Brunner's gland and the crypts of liver cohen. So here you see that the, these are the Brunner's gland found in the submucosa of duodenum. Submucosa of duodenum will have the Brunner's gland. They are found in the submucosa of duodenum. And they secrete usually mucus. So secretion of mucus takes place here. You can see this is the mu submucosa part. So in the submucosa of duodenum, you will find the Brunner's gland. And they secrete what? They secrete mucus. Rest you see the crypts of Liber Cohen. You can see here. 
Now this gland is going down. You can see some crypts here. These are the crypts. So these crypts are the crypts of liver cohen found in the intestinal region. And they secrete some digestive enzymes. Some cells of them called enterocyte will secrete enzymes. But there are some cells called panet cells which will secrete some lysozyme component which is antibacterial. Okay. And it goes for phagocytosis also. Goblet cells of the crypts of liver coen will secrete mucus and argenta fin cells of the crypts of liver coen will secrete 5-hydroxytryptamine. This is also called as this is also called serotonin or serotonin. So this is also coming from what? The cells of the crypts of liver coen. Okay. Some cells of crypts of liver coen which are argenta fin cells are producing this. Even panet cells are producing lysozyme and goblet cells are producing mucus whereas enterocytes will produce the digestive enzymes coming out of the crypts of liver coen. And that is why the secretion which comes from the crypts of liver coen and Brunner's gland is called as intestinal juice or the succus entericus. So intestinal juice or the succus entericus is released from the Crypts of liver cohen and the Brunner's gland. So they release intestinal juice, which is also called as succus entericus. With this question has come in the neat exam also. Okay, this question has come in neat exams also. So let's talk about the gastric glands now. Gastric glands, they have some mucus neck cells. So mucus neck cells will be two types. One is the surface mucus cells. One is the mucus neck cells. Both of them, they secrete mucus. They secrete mucus. So one will be present in the surface region. One will be present in the neck region. Okay. Parietal cell. Parietal cell is also called as auxentic cells. Auxentic cells produces, produce HCL. They produce hydrochloric acid and castles intrinsic factor they also produce castles intrinsic factor okay and next comes your chief cells or the peptic cells these produce the proenzymes proenzyme you can say or you can say zymogens these zymogens or proenzymes are produced by the chief cells or the peptic cells and those zymogens are prorenin prorenin and pepsinogen okay and g cells will produce a hormone called gastrin you can see here g cell also produces a hormone called gastrin so this is a part of gastric glands so let us talk now about the digestion of food so digestion of digestion starts in the buccal cavity and the carbohydrate you know that is starch is going to be converted so this is the chemical process the chemical process of digestion will start in the buccal cavity and the enzyme that is going to start is the salivary amylase so salivary amylase is also called as tyalin this is going to convert the starch into maltose, isomaltose and alpha dextrins. Now at a pH of 6.8 it is going to work and only 30% of starch is digested in the buccal cavity. Is digested by salivary amylase in buccal cavity. Okay. So let's see. So only 30%. Okay, rest 70% will be by pancreatic amylase. So this is a carbohydrate splitting enzyme and it requires chloride ions for the activation that already we discussed. Okay, so let's see here. Next is the digestion which starts in the stomach. Now, the enzymes that were working on the carbohydrates, they are still active. When they come in the stomach also, they work for at least 10 to 15 minutes or maximum 20 to 30 minutes. 
but afterwards they will get disintegrated and now the proenzyme that is pepsinogen so this pepsinogen which is a proenzyme released by the peptic or the chief cells converts into the active form that is pepsin and once it is converted in the presence of hcl now this pepsin now can convert the pepsinogen into now this converts the pepsinogen into the active pepsin so that is why the pepsin is called as auto catalytic enzyme due to this reason it is called auto catalytic enzyme please remember this now listen so this pepsin which is there now is going to work on proteins now proteins are going to be converted proteins are going to be converted pepsin is going to work on them and convert them into proteoses and peptones so these are the disintegrated forms of the protein at a ph of 1.8 so this is going to take place in what this is going to take place in the stomach region in the stomach region this breaking down of the proteins is going to take place now in the infants in infants you see there is a enzyme called proreenin so proreenin also converts into renin in the presence of hcl now this renin is going to work upon a milk protein milk protein that is casein so milk protein casein is going to be worked upon by the renin enzyme and this is going to convert into para casein once para casein is formed it is going to combine with what it is going to combine with calcium ions and forms calcium para casinate so it forms calcium para casinate which is actually the curdling of milk okay you would have seen the infants they keep on just producing little bit of uh, curd like substance that is the one which has been produced there okay so curdling of milk is the formation of calcium para casinate so hope you understood this now a small amount of lipases are also secreted by gastric glands this is also important point some small amount of gastric lipase also comes from gastric glands but has very less role in the digestion of fats because fats do require little bit of emulsification also so little bit digestion can take place but not more okay let's continue with the pancreatic juice now so in the small intestine the most active enzymes will be the pancreatic enzymes which are trypsinogen chymotrypsinogen carboxy procarboxypeptidase and pancreatic amylase so this is the pancreatic amylase not the salivary amylase next is the pancreatic lipase here okay and the nucleases so do you see these are all contained in the pancreatic juice so they are coming from the pancreas please remember this this is the pancreatic lipase not the intestinal lipase and this is the pancreatic amylase not the salivary amylase okay so now what happens here you see the trypsinogen the trypsinogen gets converted into the trypsin the active form so who converts it it is enterokinase which converts the inactive trypsinogen into the active trypsin is it okay with you and here the ph will be more than 7 that is 7.8 to 8.4 this can vary okay once the trypsin is formed once this trypsin is formed this can convert trypsinogen into the trypsin this trypsin also can convert chymotrypsinogen chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin 
and even this can convert the pro enzyme that is your pro carboxypeptidase pro carboxypeptidase into the active enzyme that is carboxypeptidase now you tell me when an enzyme can convert itself also and other enzymes also will it be called autocatalytic or heterocatalytic so because of this reason the trypsin is called as heterocatalytic enzyme why it is called heterocatalytic enzyme you would have understood till now that it can convert itself also in active form of itself and even it can convert the inactive form of other enzymes like chymotrypsinogen and pro carboxypeptidase into the active form okay so here was how the conversion of the inactive enzymes takes place into the active enzymes now further we'll talk about the active activation of these enzymes now you see here these proteins proteoses and peptones that came from what came from the stomach okay so they came from the stomach and now they have entered the small intestine so in the small intestine the pancreatic juice is going to release the trypsin chymotrypsin and the carboxypeptidase in the active form now which are going to convert these proteins proteoses and peptones into the dipeptides now this dipeptides are going to be further worked by the intestinal juices but till now you can see this pancreatic juice enzymes have converted this proteins proteoses and peptones into dipeptides so now simpler and simpler forms are being made now here you see some pancreatic juices like pancreatic enzymes like nucleases so pancreatic enzymes which are nucleases which are the dnas and rnas these are dnas and rnas these nucleases will convert the nucleic acids into the nucleotide so dnas and rnas they are going to work up on the nucleic acids these are the nucleases these are the ones called dnas and rnas they will convert the nucleic acids into the nucleotide but still this these nucleotides will be worked upon by the intestinal enzymes now to convert them into the nucleoside okay even carbohydrate splitting enzyme which is found as pancreatic amylase is going to convert the starch ultimately into the disaccharides now disaccharide that is maltose maltose okay so this is the pancreatic amylase which is going to convert the polysaccharide that is a starch into maltose 30% was done in the buccal cavity 70% of starch digestion takes place here okay so the pancreatic juice is the complete enzyme it is a complete digestive juice because it is having the you know enzymes to digest carbohydrates also enzymes to digest fat and enzymes to digest proteins so pancreatic juice is called as complete digestive juice now comes the fats the fats are going to be broken down with the help of pancreatic lipase now pancreatic lipase will work on fats and convert them into diglyceride so triglycerides or the fats are going to be worked upon by pancreatic lipase these are the pancreatic lipases and they are going to convert them into the diglyceride but further further breakdown will take place by the intestinal lipase so these diglycerides diglycerides which further break down into the monoglyceride will be done by the intestinal lipase so intestinal lipase is going to convert them into the monoglycerides okay so this was about the digestion of fats which will require some emulsification also okay here you see the enzymes 
in the succus entericus now whenever we talk about succus entericus this is intestinal juice so now intestinal juice if we talk about that means we are talking about the enzymes which are going to ultimately form the end products okay so here you see the intestinal juice enzymes will be called as brush bordered enzyme why they are called brush bordered enzymes because here you see in the intestinal enzyme in the intestinal juice intestinal glands are there which are coming from those brush bordered epithelium there so most of the enzymes are called as brush bordered enzymes like dipeptidase maltase lactase sucrase nucleosidase lipases that is intestinal lipases all are going to be worked upon over here so dipeptides you see dipeptides are broken by dipeptidase into amino acids maltase will break the maltose into ultimately end products that is glucose and glucose lactase will break the lactose into glucose galactose and sucrase will break the disaccharide into monosaccharide so you see disaccharides disaccharides are broken down into monosaccharides because these are the go ones which are going to be you know involved in the absorption process so they are going to be absorbed as monosaccharides not the disaccharides so this is a very important role of the intestinal juice enzymes that is brush border enzymes now nucleotides will be worked more by the nucleotidases into they will break them into nucleosides and nucleosidases will break the nucleosides into sugar and bases so ultimate breakdown is happening by the intestinal juice enzymes only even the di and monoglycerides also are going to be broken down by the lipases that is a intestinal lipase so intestinal lipase even further it is going to break them the monoglycerides also and even diglycerides also into the fatty acids and glycerol okay let's talk about the large intestine so in large intestine there is no significant digestive activity only there no absorption of water takes place here absorption of water some minerals and certain drugs can take place so absorption here i'm not talking about digestion so no significant digestive activity occurs in the large intestine okay it has also got some you know secretion of mucus will also happen which will help in the easy lubrication of the you know undigested food that is the feces so this was the function of the large intestine large intestine will not have any significant digestive activity so let's talk now about the absorption of the digested food here absorption of the digested food so it's carried out by passive transport also and active transport also passive or active or facilitated transport so this absorption can be active or passive so if it is active it is against the concentration gradient okay against the concentration gradient it requires energy in this case so this requires energy whereas if you see the passive transport so passive transport is of two types one is the diffusion and other is the facilitated diffusion which requires some carrier proteins so this will require the carrier proteins and this is these both are against the concentration gradient so passive is along the concentration gradient sorry along the concentration gradient okay so this is all the active one which requires energy but passive does not require energy diffusion is just the passage of the fluid from higher concentration to lower concentration movement of substance from higher to lower concentration whereas 
in the facilitated diffusion there is a carrier protein carrier protein is involved here okay now let's see so if the question comes to you glucose is absorbed by active or passive or facilitated so answer is all of these different type of receptors will have some will have in some case of receptors it will be active in some regions it will be facilitated in some regions it will be by diffusion also so glucose comes in all categories even some amino acids go by passive transport and some amino acids go by active transport but if you talk about the sodium ions sodium ions by active process okay chloride ions by diffusion chloride ions by diffusion so these few points you remember that's it these are the only points which are given in your ncrt so this only what you remember now now comes the fats absorption of fats so fats cannot be absorbed these fatty acid and glycerol they are insoluble in water they cannot be absorbed into the blood directly so what should be done they have to be emulsified so they are first incorporated into the small droplets which are called as micelles okay you can see here this is the emulsified emulsification going on so the bile salts help in the emulsification of fat so emulsi after emulsification you can see small micelles have been formed they are incorporated both by those bile salts small small you know fat globules are there because this big fat globule was there which was broken down by the lipase now a small fat molecules which are produced by emulsification and acted by the lipase they are covered by those bile salts so they become micelles now these micelles now will enter into the further uh, cells intestinal cells now these micelles which are entering into the intestinal cell they again reform the chylomicrons okay here they were broken down the fatty acids and monoglycerides were being covered by those bile salts so they were called micelles now again these monoglycerides are going to form the triglycerides here the golgi apparatus will be involved in that and again they are forming the triglycerides now these triglycerides are being coated by protein cover now and this is called as chylomicron this is a bigger unit as compared to micelles so these chylomicrons cannot enter now into the blood capillary they have to enter into the lymphatic channels that is called lacteals so they will enter directly into the lymph channels that is a lacteal okay ultimately these lymph is also going to dump into the blood but because these are bigger units and they are not able to dissolve in blood so they have to go into the lacteal so this is how the fat absorption will go on now this is a summary chart from in ncrt how the absorption of different components takes place in different regions for example in mouth some drugs can be absorbed here because that below the tongue there is there is a extensive capillary lining so there some drugs can be reab can be absorbed there in the mucosal lining having so much of extensive blood capillaries some drugs can be absorbed in the stomach region you can see some monosaccharides can be absorbed like simple sugars water can be absorbed and even the alcohol absorption can also take place here most of the alcohol is absorbed in stomach only small intestine is a major organ it is a principal organ for absorption of nutrients so here you can see almost glucose fructose fatty acids glycerol amino acids almost all of the components are absorbed here either it is in the blood stream or the lymph okay that is going to be absorbed in this part large intestine some water and some minerals and even some drugs can get absorbed here so large intestine also absorbs water drugs and some minerals here like calcium and all can be absorbed there so this was a summary chart of the absorption from ncrt now let's continue further with a very important you know uh, term that is calorific value so calorific value is some somewhere what is calorie if i talk about when you heat 1 gram of water by 1 degree celsius that's called calorie but when you heat 
kilogram of water by 1 degree celsius uh, temperature rises by 1 degree celsius that is called kilo calorie so when you measure something in kilo calories per gram here in your body how much energy you are getting that is called as physiological physiological value and this is a gross calorific value when you do it in the laboratory so in the laboratory you use a instrument called bomb calorie meter and you calculate how much energy you are getting you see by carbohydrate one gram will produce 4.1 kilo calorie in the bomb calorie meter but whereas in your body it will produce 4.0 kilo calorie fats in your bomb calorie meter experiment it will produce 9.4 kilo calorie but in the entire bo in human body it will produce 9.0 kilo calorie whereas proteins will produce 5.65 in bomb calorie meter in the human body it will produce four so there's a major difference here in proteins you can see okay so this is very important because sometimes the questions are asked from this so there it becomes important when you calculate those you know how much gram is being produced by one gram of fat produces how much so they will give you some 20 gram of fat or 10 gram of fat is there so total amount you have to calculate okay so there it becomes this data becomes important okay so let's talk about some disorders now and these disorders we'll not go into details we'll just stuck to ncrt only so jaundice in jaundice the liver is getting inflamed and the eyes and the skin they turn yellow due to the deposit of some bile pigment and usually this bile pigment is what bilirubin so bilirubin content increases and your you know a skin and eye they turn a little bit yellowish in color so which organ is inflamed in jaundice that is your liver there are many types of jaundice we'll not talk about that obstructive jaundice okay neonatal jaundice all these things we'll not talk about here that's not required vomiting now vomiting is also called e masses that's a kind of reverse peristalsis vomiting center is present in human brain that is medulla oblongata before vomiting comes there's always a sense of nausea so re please remember there's always a feeling of nausea which precedes the vomiting and it is actually the ejection of the stomach content through the mouth because it's a reverse peristalsis okay and this reflex action is controlled by vomit center which is present in the medulla oblongata of brain next comes the diarrhea so abnormal frequency see it is abnormal frequency of the bowel movement so when there is a abnormal frequency of bowel movement very fast bowel movements are occurring and moreover there are watery stools here here okay there are watery stools so you have increased liquidity of the feces so you have increased liquidity and there is a abnormal frequency of bowel movement then it is a case of diarrhea as most of the content is lost the water content is being lost so this will reduce the absorption of food also okay next comes the constipation in constipation there's a irregular okay the bowel movements become irregular they're not regularly you know eliminating those feces so it is retained for longer time in the feces are being retained for longer time in the colon as compared to normal time so that is why the you know bowel movements are occurring irregularly okay indigestion now in this case indigestion they can be you know uh, proper secretion of enzymes may not take place proper secretion of enzymes if it doesn't take place that can lead to what indigestion you that one can have the feeling of fullness but the problem is digestive enzymes are not being released properly and there can be many reasons for this like you eating too much of a spicy food okay too much of a spicy food or having too much of anxiety can also cause indigestion okay so this was all about the basic disorders of digestive system now we'll talk about the difference between the wash yorker and marasmus so let's see wash yorker so wash yorker and marasmus these are actually uh, 
प्रोटीन एनर्जी माल न्यूट्रिशन दीज आर पी ई एम केस ऑफ पी एम मीन्स प्रोटीन एनर्जी माल न्यूट्रिशन दिस इज प्रोटीन एनर्जी माल न्यूट्रिशन दिस क्वेश्चन हैज कम एक्चुअली तो प्लीज बी केयरफुल वेन यू आर रीडिंग दिस टर्म्स वॉश योर कर ऑलवेज अकस फ्रॉम वन टू फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ एज वन टू फाइव और सम से थ्री ईयर्स ऑफ एज तो एनी थिंग यू कैन राइट वन टू थ्री ईयर्स और फाइव ईयर्स ओके वन टू थ्री ईयर्स यू कैन राइट और फाइव ईयर्स नाउ वेयर एज इफ यू टॉक अबाउट मरासमस मरासमस ऑलवेज अकर्स इन इन फैन अकर्स इन इन फैन वॉट आर इन फैन दैट इज बिलो वन ईयर टिल वन ईयर ओनली वी कॉल दम एज इन फैन तो अप टू वन ईयर ओनली अप टू वन ईयर ऑफ एज ओके नाउ इन वॉश योर कर दे इज अ स्किन पिगमेंटेशन अकर्स स्किन पिगमेंटेशन अकर्स हेयर विच इज नॉट अकरिंग इन द मरासमस सो इट हैज नो स्किन पिगमेंटेशन प्लीज रिमेंबर दिस हाँ तो क्वेश्चन कम्स इन विच केस यूल फाइंड द ईडिमा अकरिंग ईडिमा अकर्स हेयर Edema occurs. Here it is no edema. Okay. Actually, why edema occurs? Because it is exclusively protein deficiency. So major, majorly, it is protein deficiency only. Whereas here it is majorly calorie deficiency. So please remember. Here it is calorie deficiency, and there it is protein deficiency. So major protein is deficient. So when the protein is deficient, it reduces your, it disturbs your blood colloidal osmotic pressure, and that is why the edema occurs here. Okay, here the calorie deficiency takes place. Child becomes emaciated. Child becomes emaciated. Emaciated means very thin. Okay, even the ribs protrude out. Ribs protrude out here. He is a voracious feeder. He is a voracious feeder. Eats too much. Okay, this is something characteristic of marasmus. But here, if you talk about the washerker patient, washerker patient will have the uh, you know pot bellied. His belly can be. Increased in size, so he is pot bellied sometimes. Okay, but still, the swelling will occur, but he is still not having the proper energy. So lethargy will be there in the washer car case also. Okay, so let us now come to the various questions which are asked in exams. So first question you see, NEET 2021, which question was asked? Is sphincter of odai is present at? is it present at the junction of jejunum and duodenum no is it present at the iliocecal junction no so junction of hepatopancreatic duct and duodenum will have the sphincter of odai if you remember junction of hepatopancreatic duct and duodenum usually has what the sphincter of odai okay so answer should be c here succus entericus such easy questions are being asked so don't think that you know tough questions will come Qu questions will come from ncert usually so be specific read most of the points from ncert almost each and every point should be clear from ncert succus entericus is referred to as it is not chyme it is not pancreatic juice it is called as intestinal juice so intestinal juice comes from which glands they come from the brunner's gland and the crypts of liber quan identify the correct statement with reference to human digestive system which was asked in neet 2020 is cirrhosa the innermost or outermost okay ileum is highly coiled part okay let us consider this vermiform appendix arises 
from duodenum or it arises from cecum now ileum opens into a small intestine why it will open into a small intestine already it is a part of a small intestine it is going to open into the large intestine so simple answer you see ileum is a highly coiled part simple and such easy questions are coming in neat 2020 and 2021 okay so don't go for too much of extensive study go for most of the points are coming from ncert focus on that which of the following terms describe human dentition this is such a easy question again neat 2018 is it thicodon diaphyron and homodont are they homodont next comes the thicodon diaphyron and heterodont so this is the correct answer they are thicodont a fixed in jaw diaphyron means they are have two sets of uh, dentition is present in lifetime and even they have incisors canines premolars and molars so this is the correct answer okay such easy questions have been asked which cells of the crypts of liber cohen secrete antibacterial lysozyme and this is not given exactly in ncert but ncert has talked about the lysozyme there so lysozyme is being secreted by the panet cells panet cells will secrete the lysozyme component okay which is antibacterial which has phagocytic properties the hepatic portal vein drains the blood to liver from so hepatic portal vein carries so much of nutrients so liver has blood supply from two regions one is the hepatic artery which is giving the blood supply to the liver other is the hepatic portal vein hepatic portal vein carries the you know blood from the stomach region from the intestine region from the you know uh, lower intestine uh, the, the small intestine large intestine all these you know blood is being carried by the hepatic portal vein to the liver so it is intestine also it is stomach also and it is the kidneys and heart also oh sorry uh, the intestine is stomach and the intestine only okay but majorly if we talk about that is the intestine part so majorly it is intestine so stomach intestine spleen all these are correct but majorly it takes place from the it takes blood from what intestine so hepatic portal vein will drain the blood to liver from majorly from the intestine okay so kidney anyway is not correct heart is anyway not correct stomach is little bit correct okay but still we'll go for intestine because majorly it is intestine only okay a baby boy aged 2 years is admitted to play school he is going to a play school and passes through a dental checkup the dentist observed that the boy had 20 teeth now he had 20 teeth that means milk teeth were present okay milk teeth so milk teeth are 20 only which teeth were absent in the boy this was asked in neat 2017 so obviously milk teeth never have premolars so premolars are absent in milk teeth dentition so you go for what premolars are absent okay which of the following guards the opening of hepatopancreatic duct into the duodenum it was easy question already we discussed once neat 2016 also it has come so that sphincter is a sphincter of odi got it which of the following is statements is not correct here which is not correct just read once neat 2015 goblet cells are present in the mucosa of intestine and secrete mucus absolutely correct because goblet cells secrete mucus auxentic cells are present in the mucosa of stomach and secrete hcl yes auxentic cells or the parietal cells secrete what hcl and extrinsic factor cases intrinsic factor SNI are present in the pancreas and secrete carboxypeptides yes because these SNI secrete enzymes so this is the enzyme here this is also correct Bruner's gland are present in the submucosa of stomach no they are present in the submucosa of duodenum and they don't secrete pepsinogen anyway so this is the wrong answer here got it the primary dentition in human differs from permanent dentition in not having one of the following types of teeth again need to 2015 this question has are been asked so again the answer will be premolars 
तो प्री मोलाज आर नॉट प्रेजेंट इन द मिल्क टीथ डेंटिशन ओके नाउ थैंक यू फॉर दर पेशेंस एंड कीप प्रैक्टिसिंग दोज क्वेश्चन विच आर गिवेन इन योर एप तो फिजिक्स वाला एप प्लीज ट्राई टू सॉल्व ऑल दोज प्रैक्टिस पेपर्स गिवेन इन दैट ऑल द बेस्ट थैंक यू